whole world listens to the twisted scream of the jet. Men gasp at speeds undreamt of yesterday, and their sons stand awestruck when the jet jockeys ride the sky. Tight-lipped military observers weigh the performance of each new plane. Every country is vitally interested in the jet power of other nations. Britain, birthplace of jet propulsion, one needs to build the first jet-powered passenger liner. The Comet is designed for long-range flights across the world. powerful turbojet in production today, the Sapphire engine, is Britain's bid for fighter supremacy of the skies. America is building a mighty jet armada. The Stratojet, the 600 mile an hour bomber, which US airmen say takes off like a homesick angel. The full strength of the Soviet Air Force is a closely guarded secret. But the MIG-15, shown here for the first time, is known to be a fast-climbing fighter, specially equipped for high-altitude bomber interception. Intelligence reports reveal Russia still has two ace fighters up its sleeve. Today, a new country in a new field of endeavor, Canada is staking an early claim in the blowtorch era. Mass production of jet fighters for the Royal Canadian Air Force is already underway in a Canadian aircraft factory near Montreal. Here, Canadair's 6,000 employees are turning out the US-designed F-86 Sabre. Chosen as the RCAF's new short-range interceptor day fighter, the single-seater F-86 has won battle honors in Korea as a highly maneuverable, top-speed combat plane. Outside Toronto, Canada's own aircraft engineers took up for the first time the daring challenge of designing a jet plane from the ground up. Men like chief designer E.H. Atkins and transport engineer J.C. Floyd. They were playing for big stakes, nothing less than supremacy of the commercial skyways. Their answer was the jetliner, the second jet transport in the world. With twice the speed of the ordinary airliner and the engines barely heard in the cabin, the jetliner's 50 passengers ride in unruffled comfort, 30,000 feet up. While the jetliner made the headlines, behind locked doors, Avro Canada worked to fill a top priority order from the Air Force. And now the reps are coming off Canada's hush-hush night fighter, the CF-100. Expectant stillness of the hangar, the men who built the plane are tense with excitement. Each man wonders, had they miscalculated somewhere, or will it scorch off beautifully into the sky? Behind that sleek black question mark lay years of hard work and headaches for all of us. It meant acres of blueprints and a thousand adjustments. We'd never attempted anything like this before. It called for the closest collaboration by hundreds of specialists, experts in metals, aerodynamics, instrument and airframe designers, and the genius of young men like our chief fighter design engineer, John Frost. One of our biggest headaches was the engine, because we decided to design our own, the Orenda. 
Beneath its simple exterior, the turbojet presents a complex problem. It must withstand terrific heat and still maintain precision accuracy. At the nose of the turbojet, the air is sucked in by a fan with hundreds of small whirling blades which squeeze the air back into the flame chambers. Squirts of flaming fuel turn the air into hot gases, creating tremendous thrust. Part of this power is turned back to keep the engine rolling. The expanded gases hurtle out of the tail at 1,200 miles an hour, thrusting the plane through the sky. The nerve center of the jet fighter is the cramped cockpit where the pilot sits on his safety ejector seat. His life may depend on the cockpit layout and the exact position of every control and switch and lever. In a wooden mock-up, our test pilot, Bill Waterton, checks every contingency of combat. Because once in the air, grappling with the physical strain of flight at more than 10 miles a minute, there just won't be time to fumble for an out-of-reach lever. Still shrouded in secrecy, the new fighter is taking on definite shape. Engines swing into position. The men who must keep it in fighting trim come to the plant while the work goes on. Air Force engineers and mechanics get a vital X-ray insight before the aluminum skin is riveted around the fuselage. Well, she's almost finished now. We put everything we know into it. A long time we've sweated on it, millions of dollars have been spent on it, and it's up to Waterton now. The CF-100 is ready for her first takeoff. Another twin jet fighter like this one. It can fly the Atlantic non-stop. It takes less than one hour from Montreal to Toronto. With radar, she can see in the dark. She's built to withstand the toughest weather and can range far from home base to intercept an enemy. It's the first all-Canadian fighter. And with the Oranda engine, we built to power it. Well, believe me, it's quite a plane. Already, the blowtorch era is scorching bold headlines across the sky. New concepts of travel appear as ramjet helicopters hover above the backyards of tomorrow. In the bomb bays of a B-29, the experimental goblin, a jet parasite fighter, is clutched, poised for combat. How far experimental jets have progressed is hidden from the public eye above desert proving grounds. But enough is glimpsed to prove there is a revolution in the sky. Fresh wonders lie in fighters which nose up like sharp-tongued bees to suck their fuel from flying service stations. Fantastic shapes of planes appear. Some soar like the giant albatross, faster and faster, toward the stormy barriers of sound and onward to calm supersonic seas. And as they curl in spirals round the globe, the screaming jets demand a new slant on the world of flight in the future.